Photosynthesis requires three things, carbon dioxide, water and light. The leaf is the part of the plant where all these three things come together, which means they must be adapted to their function. Plants, if you ever look at a leaf, leaves have a very wide flat surface on the front, which is shown here. This increases the surface area exposed to sunlight, which means more sunlight is absorbed. Leaves are also arranged in a sort of mosaic pattern, which, re which reduces leaf on leaf shadow, which means that more leaves can absorb more sunlight. A third adaptation is that leaves are thin, which you have probably noticed in how flat leaves are. The reason this is an adaptation is because most light is absorbed in the first few millimeters of the leaf, so if you had a really fat leaf, this would just be wasted space. But the thinness of the leaf then allows a shorter diffusion distance for gas exchange, which, in relation to photosynthesis, is the intake of carbon dioxide and output of oxygen. A leaf cell also has ad adaptations in the microscopic level. The first of which, going from the top down, is the waxy cuticle on top of the leaf, which is transparent and lets the maximum amount of light in the cell. There are also these palisade mesophyll cells, which contain chloroplasts and are aligned in a vertical structure along. This allows to collect sunlight and it means that light passes through the minimum amount of cell walls to get into the chloroplast molecule, which we can see that they go through the waxy cuticle, which is two cell walls and three to get to the chloroplasts, whereas if they were aligned horizontally, let's say going from this direction, you might, if they were three deep, they'd have to go through six as opposed to three, that's twice the amount for the same amount of height. So this is the ideal structure. There's also stomata at the bottom, which allow gas flow in and out of the leaf. They also open and close because of light intensity, which you should know from Unit 2 of AS. Um, the air spaces inside the cell, which are these bits, allows room for gas exchange, because as we know, oxygen goes out, well, photosynthesis that is, and carbon dioxide goes in in the same colour as the vacuole, obviously. Um, it also contains xylem, which bring water to the cells, which is also which is used in photosynthesis, and there's phloem to take away the product of photosynthesis, which is glucose. Here we see a very simplified version of a plant cell structure. We see here the nucleus, the cell wall here, or the cell membrane included in that, the large permanent vacuole, the other bits, represented as yellow squiggle, orange squiggle rather, because I can't deal with it. And more importantly to this topic is the chloroplast, which you probably will have heard of. This is a chloroplast. Its structure relates strongly to photosynthesis. Firstly, I'd like to direct your attention to the grana. The grana are composed of of hundreds of disc-like structures called thylakoids, which are select here. Thylakoids are the site of the light-dependent reaction in which the plant absorbs carbon dioxide and produces an intermediate which is used in the light-independent reaction. Um, thylako certain thylakoids have tubular extensions which connect it to adjacent adjacent granum which is the intergranal lamella in that it's a lamella that connects grana. The strom is the liquid inside the chloroplast and it contains enzymes needed for the light dependent reaction. It also contains um, starch granules, ribosomes, lipid droplets and some circular DNA. The circular DNA uh, allows the chloroplast to produce certain enzymes needed for photosynthesis, such as Rubisco, which you'll find about later. The chloroplast envelope, which is a double membrane, controls the molecules going from cytoplasm into the stroma, 